All right. Now, I, we've looked at the first nine chapters, and as I said, Proverbs, you have the first nine chapters are different than 10 to 31. In 10 to 31 is where you get largely the classical Proverbs, what we call classical Proverbs. There are some exceptions like the, the, about the, the woman in chapter 31 where you have some extended uh, discussions of things. But here in 10 to 31, you get collections of what are classical Proverbs. And what I plan to do is I want to go through and I've, I've organized these in ways that I hope make them more digestible. Instead of working through the different collections one at a time and then hitting this one and then saying, okay, we talked about that before, I'm trying to group them in ways that I hope will uh, have an impact on you. Now, I won't hit all of, in fact, when I taught this years ago, I called the class a short study of Proverbs because I did the nine chapters, but I don't, I don't go through every single proverb. But you'll see I, I deal with a lot of the Proverbs. So I'll do that. That'll take me a few weeks to go through a sketch. What I'm doing is a sketch of a wise person based on what can be gleaned from Proverbs. So I'll, I'll go through that, and then, then I will have, after I sketch that out, then I'll have some miscellaneous Proverbs I want to talk about. And I'll talk about the woman in Proverbs 31 uh, just to tell you how I understand what's going on there. Okay, so, so here we... Oh, turn it on. Ah. So here, a sketch of a wise person. This is what I want to look at. And here, I'll, I'll keep going back to this so you can at least follow how I'm seeing this. Now, like with all these things, when you're categorizing things, somebody may say, well, this would better go over here. I understand that. I'm just giving you my best shot on how these things appear to me. But the first thing in the sketch of a wise person is I want to give you some general attitudes and characteristics that go into being a wise person. These are just some general things. And the first is he, when I say he, you know I mean he or she, right? I just don't want to keep going through that. So he stands for he and she. All right. So he is submissive to the will of God. Submissive to the will of God. And now I have some subcategories under that. In what way? Well, I'm going to give you the ways I see that. Submissive uh, to the will of God. And the first thing is the person who is wise, a general attitude and characteristic, Submissive to the, weird, to the uh, will of God, and that person fears the Lord. Now, we talked about some, some of that in the first nine chapters. But here you see 1427. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. Now, you remember when we looked at the nine chapters, you had a, you had a number of substantive uh, things, advice about what does it mean to be wise, but largely what you got in the nine chapters was this idea that you need to want wisdom, pursue wisdom, be serious about wisdom. And then the nine chapters, which are kind of an introduction, they end in chapter nine with you have woman wisdom and woman folly. And here's this competing appeal. Will you follow woman wisdom or will you follow woman folly? Will you heed what the wise person says? Will you internalize it? Will you adopt it in your life and live your life this way or will you be like a know-it-all who said come on what do you got to tell me you see so that's it so here we have so the first thing this idea of fearing the lord being submissive to the will of the lord caring what the lord says it's not like when the lord speaks i said ah, you know so what no i fear the lord i fear the consequences of rebelling against the lord that i want to be Living the way he wants me to live because he's Lord. So he says, fear the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. The fear, 1533, the fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom and humility comes before honor. 1923, the fear of the Lord leads to life and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. 22.4, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. 23.17, let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all day. And you see this idea, not envying sinners, but living in submission to the will of the Lord. Well, this is important, foundational, fundamental. Will you fear the Lord? 
Will you respect and take seriously the will of the Lord? Will you live that way? Or will you say, you know, yeah, 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 that's a nice idea. Will you treat his will as it is in fact the will of the Lord? 24, 21, my son, fear the Lord and the king and do not join with those who do otherwise. There are a lot of people who live their lives with disrespect to the will of the Lord. They don't care what God wants. He's saying the wise man, you can either heed this or not. The wise person says, fear the Lord and don't join with those who do otherwise. 28, 14, blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. But whoever hardens his heart, in contrast to fearing the Lord, right? Fearing the Lord is what? A soft heart, submissive to the will of the Lord, caring what he wants because he's Lord. Well, he says here, Blessed is the one who fears the Lord, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. 31.30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And then you see here in 1.7 and 9.10, we previously talked about those. Fear the Lord there. So here's this first thing, and the sketch of the wise person is, is submissive to the will of God in what way? First, fears the Lord. Second, trust in the Lord rather than his or her own understanding. And you, you see this. this, this screen keeps going out, uh, 14, 12, and 16, 25. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Now what is that? It's saying to you that there are going to be times in your life when you think you have the better way. No, look, I, look I'm a smart guy. I know, and I'm, I'm charting everything, and I got all the stuff and the data, and I'm plotting, and I'm knowing, and this is how to go. And you say, well, this way is not the way God would have you. This way involves you in cheating. This way involves you in lying. This way involves you in unfaith. But yeah, don't you see that's the perfect solution? This is the way for me to go in this circumstance. There always should be a siren that goes off. If any of that has you going some way that is wrong and sinful and contrary to the will of the Lord. But we think that. I know best. I know that lying here will get me out of this tight. Don't tell me that telling the truth is better in this circumstance when telling the truth will wind up getting me fired from my job. How could that possibly be better? Always go with God. Always. That's what, that's what the wise man's saying. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. 1620, whoever gives thought to the word will discover good, and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Where's your trust? It's in the Lord. He is God. He knows. I'm a creature. Yes, I have an inflated sense of my understanding and all these things. I think I know all things, but I have to remember I'm a creature. He is God. 28, 25, a greedy man stirs up strife, but the one who trusts in the Lord will be enriched. 28, 26, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. You say, well, does that mean that I can't? No, he's talking about when you have these ideas and you put your judgments and your assessments over God's. When you trust in your own mind over what God has revealed, you always go with what God has revealed. Right, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. The wisdom of the Lord, what God has revealed. The fear of man lays a snare. That's what's motivating you. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And in, in chapter 3, verse 5, we already talked about that. Trusting in the Lord rather than in one's own understanding. So in this sketch of a wise person, submissive to the will of God, fears the Lord... Trust in the Lord rather than in his or her own understanding. Incorporate this into your life. This is the wise man saying, do you want to live well in this world? Then absorb these things. That's what the nine chapters were begging you to do. Receive it. Pursue it. Internalize it. Well, now we're looking. What will we do with these things? That shuns evil. And does what is righteous. And you see here, 1416, on shuns evil. One who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. So that you and I, as people who are disciples, we're looking and saying, okay, uh, is this situation something that is 
pure and right and just? And is it something I, I'm, I'm going to be careful about getting pulled into situations and circumstances that might pull me into wrong? I'm alert to those. I'm not just, uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> you know, just kind of bopping along. I'm alert because I know there's, there's my enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. So I'm alert to these things. Cautious and turns away from evil. Doesn't go down that path. 16.6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. This is how we are to be. This is how you're to live. You are to turn away from evil. When you see that temptation, that lure, over here, come this way. This is the way to go. Join with me and do it. Whoop, I'm going this way. I'm turning away from evil. I'm not going to go down that path. You see in 3.7, 4.27, and 8.13, you saw this same idea of shunning evil, turning away from evil, and we already talked about those when we went through the first nine chapters. Does what is righteous. 15.9, the way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who pursues righteousness. The way of the wicked is an abomination. We are not to be that way. And your life will not be blessed. Just look at people's lives who decide this is how they're going to live. Nobody wants to be anywhere near them. They oftentimes wind up in jail or dead. And they're just like, you know, they're like a wrecking ball to be around. And so it says here, the way of the wicked is an abomination, but he loves, he loves him who pursues righteousness. 21, 21, whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. So in talking about how do we live in this world? How do we live in God's created order? Well, these are, this is the sketch of a wise man. Heed it. Listen to it. Breathe it in. Make it a part of you. And then we had in 220, I talked about that, does what is righteous. So we have here that this is submissive to the will of God, fears the Lord, trusts in the Lord rather than in his or her own understanding, shuns evil, and does what is righteous. Now I have a number of subcategories. I first put up generally shuns evil and, and does what is righteous. But now there are subcategories under here about shunning evil and doing what is righteous. And the first one that kind of reinforces this is hypocritical worship is an abomination. I put this under shuns evil and does what is righteous because it speaks of the person who's doing evil, living an evil life, living in rebellion to God, and then comes and worships God without repenting. You see, the grace of God covers all sin. I've said many times, I don't care what you've done. I don't care how shameful it is. I don't care how long you've been in it and how often you've done it. Repentance is the way to God. The door to God is always open. Okay? So, I'm talking about somebody here who is impenitent, living in sin, living in rebellion, and then they come and worship God. You see, this is the thing, the person who's living, getting drunk all the time, living, sleeping with his boyfriend or girlfriend with no intention of stopping this. And we can multiply these things and comes here and, well, how does God feel about hypocritical worship? 15.8, the sacrifice of the wicked, here we are worshiping with sacrifices, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. I say it that way because the screen keeps blinking out. Okay, is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. Will you hear this? Will you internalize this so that you would say, okay, that's out for me? So that from that point you would be saying, I will not do that. I will repent and then come and offer God true sacrifice because Worship of God, the context for worshiping God is a life of submission. That's always the case. Worship flows out of that context, out of a life that is submitted to him. 21, 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with evil intent, trying to do something. But see, the sacrifice of the wicked, we cannot be that way. And so hear, hear what the wise man is saying. And, you know, take it in. 
Uh, second subcategory under shuns evil and does what is righteous. Avoids illicit sexual relations. In our society, our society is just sex crazy. Just sex crazy. And we have taught everybody, taught young people, this is the essence of life. This is all that matters in life. Everything's about that. That's the center, the focal point of all that you are, everything. And so we wind up thinking, okay, it doesn't matter. We have get-togethers or whatever the word is, hookups and all of this kind of stuff. Casual sex being promoted, is like, that's just the way it is. We freed ourselves from these, you know, old people hang-ups. Well, there's the enemy, that's the enemy's voice telling you that. And you think that's really going to bless your life. You think that's the way. To, it's not. Now you're either going to listen to God or you're going to say, what does he know? You see, that's why you have this idea, those first chapters about you have to understand the value of wisdom. You have to want wisdom. You cannot come and say to wisdom, I don't care. Get away from me because I don't want that to be the answer. You have to be somebody who says, okay, let me hear it. I want to be wise in how I live. Avoids illicit sexual relations. 23, 26 to 28. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. For a prostitute is a deep pit. An adulteress is a narrow well. She lies in wait with a robber and increases the traitors among mankind. Those who are unfaithful. Traitors. That's a good word. That's a good word for people who cheat on their spouses, traitors, because they're breaking that bond that they have. I mentioned a number of times how this was emphasized in the first nine chapters. 2.16 to 19, 5.21 to 23, 6.20 to 35, 7.1 to 27. Over and over again, the young man was warned about the dangers of illicit sexual relations. And now we see it again in, in 10 to 31. So it is important. I know the society is telling you, you, you are a fool if you pass up premarital sex. You're missing out on the party. You're missing out on what is fun. But the wise man is telling you something different. Now, who are you going to go with? Are you going to go with the voices of your culture? Or are you going to receive the wisdom of God? That's the choice. That's Woman wisdom and woman folly. They're both calling to you. Now, who will you listen to? That's the question. That's the question that's put here in Proverbs. Shuns evil and does what is righteous. Does not get drunk. Now, before I became a Christian, I loved getting drunk. I've been drunk thousands of times in my life. You know, in fact, Brother John, I think most of you know Brother John led me to Christ. Brother John became, we were sitting down one time and I told him, you know, he was, he was getting pulled by Jesus. I don't remember if he became a Christian yet or not, <clears throat> but he was definitely in the throes. The Lord was hot on his trail. And so he was sitting down here and in fact, he comes down and he wouldn't leave me alone. He'd keep coming down to my house in Orlando, Florida, and he'd be after me because he loves me. And so he wouldn't let me rest. And I love John, always loved John. And so we've always had a very close relationship. I've told people that anybody else I'd have just blown off. But John's after me. And so, so this idea, and I told him one time, I said, listen, you can do what you want to, but I'm never going to quit drinking. I actually couldn't understand what somebody would do with their spare time if they didn't get drunk. I mean, it was, uh, of course, stoning was involved also. Uh, but... But here's this idea. Listen to what the wise man says about getting drunk. He says here, wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. I mentioned some weeks ago, can you imagine the actual cost of drunkenness in our society? I want you to think about that. I'm not just talking about all the people who get killed and maimed on the highway because people are drunk driving. All of the work that doesn't get done because people are drunk or have hangovers. All of the fights that people get into because part of being drunk is you think you're bulletproof and so some people get quite nasty, belligerent. All of the fights, all of the, the domestic abuse that goes on because of alcohol and on and on and on. The murders, 
the crimes that occur because somebody's drunk and he loses his sense of judgment, winds up in prison. Just think about it. And here it's a, the wise man is saying, you know, I've been here all the time. Woman wisdom sitting here saying, I've been here all the time telling you this is a fool's move. 21.17, whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man, but he who loves wine and oil will not be rich. 23.19 to 21, hear my son and be wise and direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and slumber will clothe them with rags. You look out in the homeless population. I understand that there can be many reasons for homelessness. Okay, but one large reason is intoxication that has made people unable to work because they are drunk and stoned. This is the, so many of the people are homeless because of drug and alcohol addiction. You see, and this is what the wise man is saying: slumber will clothe them with rags. This is where this leads. 23, 29 to 35. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes that wounds without cause? I always think of that uh, Jimmy Buffett song where he says, it's a real beauty, a Mexican cutie, this tattoo. How it got here, I haven't a clue. Many drunk people can relate to that. Out doing something, Come up and say, hmm, wake up trying to think, now what was I doing last night? Oh no, oh, I hope I wasn't doing that. And yes, you were. I'll tell Brother John here, I, I have many stories I can tell on John, but I'm pretty confident he won't mind me sharing this one. John was a, uh, of course, we were simpatico. John was a boozer, stoner. Uh, we were very much alike in that. And John was stationed in London. He was in the Navy Reserve and he was in London there. Of course, I won't... He, I think he set the record for his alcohol content when he blew on those crystals. They about, but anyway, he, he's out there, and this, this policeman sees him, this Bobby. And he tells him, he said, looks dead at my brother and says, well, you were having a fine time up here last night with your shoes off. And my brother's going, what? <laughs> shoes off? All right, that's what this is. He who has wounds without cause wakes up and says, what happened? What happened? Well, you were drunk, and you probably got in a fight. All right. Who has redness of eyes, those who tarry long over wine, those who go to try mixed wine, do not look at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. Many people have said things when they were drunk that they would like to take back, but as it is with speech anytime, you can't, you can't suck that baby back. You say things, and they can be very damaging. And so this certainly happens when people go on, get drunk, and they lose uh, sense and control. You'll be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on top of a mast. This is this idea. <laughs> you people who have been drunk know what I'm talking about. This idea of the bed going, uh, ready to vomit. All right, they struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel, I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. This is not the way to live. I don't care what the world tells you. I don't care that it tells you that this is the elixir for you know, social involvement. If you get drunk, then you'll be able to mingle. Then you'll be looser and all that stuff. There is a price to be paid for that. Now, who are you going to listen to? You're going to listen to Hollywood and the beer manufacturers and the booze manufacturers? Or are you going to listen to God? That's why, woman wisdom or woman folly? Who are you going to listen to? That's the question. 31, 1 to 9, the, the words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. 
Give strong drink to the one who's perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Now what I think is going on here in, verse, in 31, 4 to 7 is advice from the mother of the king that the king should avoid intoxication. The king is too important. And his responsibilities are too great to have his mind clouded by drink. To have his judgment and his mind. He's too important and his responsibilities are too great to have that happen. And verses 6 and 7, the way I read them, they reinforce that point. They reinforce the point by saying that getting drunk should be left to failed kings. It should be left to failed kings, to those who've been vanquished, to kings who've been expelled, and thus they stand to forget nothing more important than their own misery and poverty. You see, you're too important to be doing this. Leave that for people who've been vanquished, the kings who've been vanquished or expelled. I analogize this to a situation where if you said, listen, if we had a basketball team and the coach tells his players to avoid alcohol, and then the coach says to those players, give the booze to those who got cut. See, he's not really saying ply those who were cut with alcohol. He's saying you are not to be engaged in that. You are on a mission and have a purpose. You see, leave that for the losers. Leave it for the losers is the idea. Now, you could take 6 and 7 and say, well, no, I think what he's really doing, he's saying ply your poor subjects with booze so they won't know any better. You could, you could understand that. I can think of no worse advice to give somebody than to drown your sorrows in grog. But see, you have to understand this in the context of all of Scripture with the flat condemnations of drunkenness. I don't see how that interpretation could be correct. You see, so I think what it is, it's this idea of saying, listen... You're too important to have your mind clouded. Leave that for failed kings. Not meaning go ahead and actually ply them. It's just a way of reinforcing the dangers of alcohol. The dangers of alcohol. But in any event, drunkenness, avoid it. It is wrong, it is sinful, it is unwise, and it will damage your life. Okay? It will damage your life. And so the response ought to be, if you're somebody who's engaging in that, here and now, your response ought to be, Lord, I'm through with that in my life. That should be the response. I'm through with that in my life from here forward. And then to your spouse and your children, you would go and say, I've been doing this, but I'm through with that in my life because the Lord has convicted me and called me to be through with that in my life. That's what should happen. All right, here we are, sketch of, sketch of the wise person, shuns evil and does what is righteous, does not steal or defraud. What kind of person should I be in navigating God's world? Doesn't steal or defraud. Here you have a number of texts, 11.1, 1, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. You understand what's going on here, right? When you're selling things and I'm weighing them out like, yeah, hey, give me a pound of wheat and I got this thing over here that really is a half a pound and I've got it marked for a pound. You see, so I'm giving you a half a pound of wheat, and I'm claiming I'm giving you a pound. It's just a way of me cheating you, okay? And so this was obviously a common thing, because you see it here. It says, 1611, a just balance and scales of the Lord's, all the weights in the bag are his work. Unequal weights and unequal measures. doesn't matter how you cheat somebody. If you deceive them and think you're giving them X when you're giving them Y, to your benefit, well, that's wrong. You see, you're cheating them and you're defrauding them and you're stealing from them. And that's not how to live. You say, but listen, you know how much money I can make doing this? People sell drugs. You say, listen, you're selling drugs, you're damaging people's lives. No, no, they like it. They like it. It's free market. You see, they like it. I'm happy to sell it to them. Do you see what you're doing, though? You're, you're, you're winding up harming people. So what? You can make money. And you say, that's good for me as I can make money. Well, this is what's going on here. These people are saying, you know how much money I can make doing this? If I cheat people, I can make money. 
If I steal or embezzle from my employer, I can make money. Okay, well, who are you going to listen to? <laughs> you're, going to you're going to chart your own course and say, look, in my eyes, this is a smart move, or you're going to listen to the Lord. That's the question about wisdom. Woman wisdom or woman folly. He says in 2010, okay, 2023, unequal weights are an abomination to the Lord, and false scales are not good. 22, 28, do not move the ancient landmark that your fathers have set. Well, what's that about? That's about stealing somebody's property. Yeah, go down here from the oak tree to the big rock. Well, watch this. Here's the big rock now. What did I do? I just sliced off part of this guy. What am I doing? I'm just stealing this property. You say, but, but that helped. Do you see? I get the advantage then. That's good grazing property. I said, I know you get the advantage of it. That's not the point. The point is to get the advantage, you have to steal or defraud. Do not do that. That's not the way to live. 23, 10, 11. Do not move an ancient landmark or enter the, enter the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is strong. He will plead their cause against you. 29, 24, the partner of a thief hates his own life. He hears the curse but discloses nothing. Here's a guy who's involved with another guy in stealing. They're trying to get the truth of him. He won't give him up. He won't testify, won't say. And so he's going to suffer for that. 39, remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. We live in a society that really tries to justify stealing on the basis of poverty. And I'm here to tell you that there's no justification for stealing. That's what I love. You remember the, the movie Cinderella Man? I've mentioned this to you before. It's about the uh, fighter. I can't, Braddock, I think his name was. It's based on a true story, heavyweight fighter. And uh, the scene I love in the movie is they were down and out. This was in the Depression. And his boy was stealing, literally stealing, I think, food. And his dad got him, and they caught the kid, and he had to come down to the store and give it back and apologize. And his father out there sat down with him, and he said, we never steal. Okay? We never steal. And that's the idea, see? That's character. That's character. I don't steal. I would rather be humiliated and go beg for somebody to help me than to steal. And that's, how they, that's what's being said here. Lest I be poor and steal. And do what? Profane the name of my God. No stealing. No defrauding. No cheating. When people do business with people of God, they ought to say, listen, guys, is absolutely straight as an arrow. Now, can people slander you? Can they say false things? Yes, they can. But in the truth needs to be that we are People who do not steal, do not fraud, and reflect these other things. Sketch of a wise person. Uh, I ran out of room here. I'm on E. Shuns evil and does what is righteous. Is not lazy. Now, this is another thing. You saw that in, in the earlier chapters. Is not lazy. I think you're going to be surprised about how much of Proverbs addresses this. Is not lazy. 10, 4, and 5. <clears throat> a slack hand causes poverty. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. A slack hand causes poverty. Another thing when I think about homelessness. I understand there are many reasons for it. One of them is intoxication. Another is laziness. You see, that's become what you can't say. You can't say that about people. Listen, when I see people who are stronger than I am, Standing on a corner begging people who got thousands of bucks in their pocket. This is just a racket. Okay, this is just a racket from somebody who doesn't want to work. He wants to go to people who do work and say, give me the fruit of your labor. It's not right. It's not right. Laziness is a bad thing. Uh, here it is, 1026. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes... So is the sluggard to those who send him. Isn't that beautiful? You know, like vinegar, you're like poof, poof, smoke burns your eyes. You send a lazy person to do something, and you'll regret it. You send somebody who's lazy, well, let's see, first thing I can look for is how can I get out of doing anything? That's my number one priority. 
I don't want to work. I think work's for saps. The smart guy figures out how not to work. And so watch me. I'll do as little as I can to get by on. This is not a way to live. Now you can say, well, what do you know, dude? I'm trying to convey to you what God knows. <laughs> you see, that's the thing. Will you listen to God? Woman wisdom or woman folly? 12, 11. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he, he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. 12, 24. The hand of the diligent will rule, but the slothful will be put to forced labor. 12, 27. Whoever is slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. You have to work and work hard. That's how this world is. You're not entitled not to work. No, 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 I shouldn't have to work. No, you should. <laughs> this is how the world is. 13.4, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. 14.23, in all toil there is profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty. 15.19, the way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, trying to cut through that, you see. That's like the path of the sluggard. You choose that route, and you're going to have a hard life. You'll look back when you're 40 years old and go, why is my life so difficult? Partly because you chose to be a sluggard. You didn't want to work. You didn't want to say, listen, this is difficult, but I need to work now for what I see in the future. This is wisdom being conveyed to you. 18.9, uh, sluggard is a hedge of thorn, but the path of upright is a level highway. That's the end of 15.19. 18.9, whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. So here we are working on something, you're doing nothing. Well, that's like destroying what I'm doing. He goes, 1915, slothfulness cast into a deep sleep and an idle person will suffer hunger. 1924, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. You talk about lazy. This guy won't even pull it back. He got some, oh, that's just too much work, man. Somebody put it in my mouth for me. <laughs> 24, the slugger does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. 2013, love not sleep lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will have plenty of bread. 21, 25, the desire of the sluggard kills him and his hands refuse labor. The sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I'll be killed in the streets. You think I'm going to go out there and work? I can't do that. I mean, I'd love to. But there's a lion out there. I can't go out. 22, 29. Do you see a man skillful in his work? Now this I'd say because to get that way you have to be diligent. But this is really kind of after a different thing. Skillful in his work, he will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. I knew a guy who was a lawn guy. He was a good friend of mine. He's dead now in Orlando, Florida. Uh, Steve Anderson. And he just started a lawn business. He's out cutting grass and doing this kind of stuff. And Steve would do things, and he would work. He was a Christian, would work the way a Christian should work. He was honest. He would do what he was supposed to do. And he told me, he quoted this to me. You see a man skillful in his work because when he was like being, going up, and I don't know if you, you know, cutting the mayor's yard or whatever it was, he told me, see, you see a man skillful and he'll stand before kings. See, it's because the idea was because I work the way God has instructed me to be. Here I am seeing this in my life. 24, 30 to 34. I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, and behold, it was overgrown with thorns because he's too lazy to do anything about it. The ground was covered with nettles and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw it and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little, little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. 26, 13 to 16. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road. There's a lion in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. 28, 19. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. But he, but he who follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. 3127, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. That's the woman of Proverbs 31. 
And then we talked about before in chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, you saw the same idea of is not lazy. You see how much the wise person says about this. And it's very important. Is not lazy. Does not lie. I know the bell's going to ring soon. Does not lie. We are not to lie. I, I don't, you know, th- this is something that ought to be obvious. Lying is an abomination to God. We're to be truthful people even when it hurts us. You see, now I understand there's times for diplomacy. I don't have to run in and say everything. There's wisdom involved. But when you're called on or you say something and you affirm something, it needs to be the truth. You don't lie about things. You see, to help you or to get away from something or any of that kind of... All right, whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence, but a false witness utters deceit. 1219, I heard that bell. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. 1219, I have to mark here where I quit, and I heard that bell. Thanks for coming. Next week, 104, Brother John tonight.